Hello, my friends. Welcome to Lug Nuts. My name is Tracy. I will be your host today as we roll through what is obviously a Lincoln vehicle. I wanted to take a moment and just introduce the channel and myself. I realized 10 or 11 videos in that I never do that. So <laughs> just in case you didn't know where you were or who I was, now you know. Let's. What kind of Lincoln are we looking at today? Well, let's figure that out, shall we? Okay, so today we are going to be looking at the 2022 Lincoln Corsair. Um, this is the reserve model, so it's kind of the mid-range model with a bunch of bits and pieces added to it. So it, I guess we'll start with what we usually start with, which is, what does it look, how does it look? It's a good looking car. It struck me, as soon as I picked it up, I looked at it and went, huh, you know, in real life, in the real world, it looks pretty good. It's it's not a bad looking car at all. It's got nice lines, it's got a relatively low roof line. The It's got a little bit of the sloping rear end, but not so much that it bothers you. Uh, when you're inside but we'll get to that uh, when we do the interior tour um, yeah it's uh, pretty much from every angle it's a good looking car you get 20 i believe these are 20 inch uh, blacked out rims in this particular trim and yeah i mean you get to the back and the the gate here has the net what has now become kind of the standard lincoln um brake light strip along the back and when the when the sun starts to go down it looks really good i actually quite dig that this vehicle also comes with something called the monochromatic package <laughs> What does that mean? Well, so far as I can tell, that means you get uh, body body color cladding, which if anybody who watches my videos knows, I highly approve of that. I love that. I do not like bare plastic. And then we get the body color grill, uh, which sort of has this, th these are all Lincoln um, images, but if you don't look at it very closely, it kind of looks like melty beeswax or uh, uh, honeycomb, sorry. Anyway, yeah. Either way though, um, it's it's a nice looking car. It really is. I like the little ripples in the hood and stuff like that. It's got it's got a good face, and that absolutely works for me. Um, it must be said, this is uh, just about in 2023. The Corsair is going to undergo is undergoing has undergone uh, a mid cycle refresh, which is mostly going to affect, of course, that grill. I think it's a little bigger and whatnot. So of course, my timing is impeccable, but. I take these vehicles when I can get them. All right, let's take a look at the rear cargo area in the Corsair. Uh, so power lift gate uh, that comes in all trim levels, which is kind of in this class of vehicle becoming standard equipment um, and as well it should be. So in the back here, you get a decent sized cargo space for your everyday shopping, etc. Underneath you get no spare tire. I found that interesting. I don't even see a can of fun juice in case you get a flat. You do get an inflator. But uh, yeah, I don't know, that's weird. I would have expected a spare. That seems like a bit of cost cutting. Nevertheless, um, that is what they have there. Uh, in the back, you get 12 volts for a bit of power if you need to do run inflatables. Um, and then you get release buttons back here. So press and hold, that drops, press and hold, and it drops. So you do, you might've heard that. I don't know how much the mic picked up, but this seat did catch the, the front, the back of the front seat on the way down. My son had that seat just a little bit further back than say my standard driving position on the driver's side here. I'm 5'8", not very long of leg, uh, and it just clears it. So if you're longer, uh, if you're a taller person, you are going to have to slide your feet, your seats forward in order to put these down uh, without any interference, which feels like there should be a solution to that maybe sacrifice a couple inches of cargo room in order to make sure that they drop probably i'm not sure but anyway um so in order to put them back up they're not fully powered you have to put them back up manually uh <laughs> which i mean given the price point you'd think they would be fully powered um seats in that regard that just seems like a bit of a no-brainer for me but nevertheless that is where we stand with the cargo area Okay, we are back inside front seats of the Corsair. So starting on the door here, you've got your power your power seat adjustments, etc. One thing the Corsair comes with are these uh, leg bolster adjustments. Mine are fully out um, and it's sort of nice. They tuck under the knees, give you a little bit of support and you can of course um, adjust everything on the seat there. You get three presets and a little button that sort of jumps you to the massaging seat. So both uh, both seats in the front are powered, obviously leather, uh, and they're both they have massage functions. So you can control them here on the the infotainment system, etc. And uh, yeah, you select as you go. But that is your sort of quick access button for that, which is nice uh, because a lot of this the menus are just you know tap tap swipe swipe blah blah blah. So that sends you straight to where you need to go. 
Uh, the We get a heads-up display. I always forget to talk about heads-up displays. This one's quite nice. It's multicolored. Uh, it gives you speed, lane position, the time, the temperature, the gear you're in, the speed, uh, the prevailing speed limit at the time, which is really good. I like that as sort of a quick reference. Also, all your, if you set it as such, all your cruise control functions are up there. They don't even show up in your dash cluster when you have it set. So it goes straight to the heads up display, unless you turn that off and then it defaults back to the dash. Speaking of the dash, we get a fully digital dash display tack on the left, speedo on the right. We get an analog speedometer, digital speedometer, you get the center cluster here. I've got it set up so that all my trip information, which I'm going to touch on, um, is on display here in the middle. That's the way I prefer it. You can tinker with it. You can change it up. I'll get it nice and close. So this will give you your fuel economy, I guess, ever since that was reset. I, I reset all the trip odometer information, but I guess I didn't reset that when I took the car. Uh, but those numbers are pretty close. Tire pressure, etc., etc. This is the calm screen, uh, which gives you nothing which is fine, I suppose, if you need a bit of a break from information overload. And then back to my preferred setup, which is right here. So, we'll, But we're going to come back to that information in a minute. Uh, the steering wheel itself, leather wrapped, of course, quite nice. You've got a two-tone arrangement in this vehicle. Again, you get that sort of rather pleasing looking... Yeah, it's pleasing. I like that leather. I like that brown. It's okay. I can't remember the color. Damn it. I should look at the sheet. But anyway, um, so you get uh, audio controls on your left. You turn... This is a, sort of a quirk of this car. Sorry, Doug, I'm not stealing your terms here. Just a bit of an oddity on this one. Um, it This turns on your cruise control functionality, which again pops up on the heads-up display. The buttons are here. Initially, I was tapping those, <laughs> and then I realized the buttons are actually behind. They're kind of... Yeah, it's weird. It, very unusual. I've never really seen anything like that before. So that's, you turn it on here and then you control it behind. Sort of strange, almost like paddle shifters in a way. Bit unusual, never seen anything like that. This is your dash control switch, so changing up the stuff in the middle. And this is your quick reference, so you can answer phone calls, you can switch to navigation. Um, sorry, navigation details in the cluster, etc. And that is, that is about it. That's the steering wheel. Oh, you get your voice, voice command button, which I never use. I hate voice commands. But that, if that is your thing, it's here. It's actually very conveniently located. That's a very wise choice. Um, if you're a voice command person, that will work very well for you. We get a frameless rear view mirror. Uh, what this does not have is a rear view mirror camera. At this trim level, and specifically, we'll get to this more in, in detail later, but at this price point, that should be a camera to be totally honest with you. Um, but nevertheless, we do not have that in this particular ve vehicle, pardon me. Um, we get our, our start, start stop button right there. It's actually quite a nice piece of finishing. I like the way that looks and feels, uh, that when you press it, it has like this, almost a click to it. It's really nice, I like that, that, that works out well. Um, and then we come to the infotainment screen. Oh boy, well, what do I tell you? Um, this is probably, other than the price of this vehicle, this is my biggest bone of contention. It's so small. And I'm not an infotainment snob. I truly am not. But this is just tiny. And then you go to the camera setup. And the cameras themselves are mediocre resolution. You know? But you get this split screen arrangement. You get the 360 representation on the right. And then the backup camera here. You can make this bigger by pressing the button. Pressing it. Oh, yeah. You got to be in reverse. Sorry. So I'll put it in reverse. And then hit that button. I'm sorry, that one, pardon me. And then you get it across the entire screen, which helps, but the angle is so low, you don't get a nice wide fish angle, fish eye anymore. I don't get it, it doesn't make any sense. It, it's very, I don't get it, I don't understand that. So let's put it back in park before I crash into something. Um, so then you go, yeah, you come back to kind of the standard screen. This is, this is small. You know, you need, I think in the 2023, uh, in addition to a front end, redo they're giving you a bigger infotainment screen um i hope so because this was just disappointing you know it's all of about you know you get this all along the bezel here it's three quarters of an inch all the way around so you're losing an inch and a half that way that way and then you lose it on the diagonal too i meant to bring a ruler with me but i completely forgot but let's measure let's do it uh sophisticated style like this. So that's the phone's about six inches and then another couple. So you get eight inches. It's an eight inch screen, which by modern standards is, is tiny. Um, there's no, no getting around it, unfortunately. So you do get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both are wired only. So you have to plug it in. 
I've complained about that enough. One of these days, they'll they'll fix that. Moving on to more positive things, you get what what Lincoln describes as piano key shifting uh, buttons here. These are actually pretty cool. I don't mind the way they're set up. Um, <laughs> it's I call them toggles, but I guess they're buttons. But I like the description descriptor of piano key. Uh, before I go too far, you also get these three buttons here. This pops you to your cameras. Uh, and then this one takes you to your driver assistance screen. So your auto start stop, you can turn it off if you want. It resets itself every time. I have yet to encounter a vehicle that will simply allow you to turn that off and leave it off. I don't know why. It just is what it is. Uh, you can also turn your auto hold on and off, etc. And then this one here is sort of your your parking aids, etc. So the quick reference buttons. Which which works. That's not bad. I don't mind that at all. Um, moving south, we get our uh, volume dials, tuning knobs, uh, audio controls here, radio controls, I should say, and then our environmental controls here. So this has your heated seats, your cooled seats, because the seats in the front are heated and cooled, uh, your heated steering wheel, which is on at the moment, and all your usual environmental control stuff. One thing I could not find on this vehicle was an off button. And when I'm recording these videos, I like to have the environmental controls off because I don't want the fan noise in the background. And a couple of days ago, I'm like, where the hell is the off button? It just, it isn't here. And then I'm like, oh, menu button. Okay, let's press that. And there you have it. So this takes you to additional climate controls. Here you can turn it, the whole system on and off. You can set dual um, and some of the other stuff that's also represented by buttons. This seems unnecessary to me. Why not just include a couple of buttons here? But I didn't design the thing, so there you go. Uh, we got a little storage pocket here with USB. You also get a 12 volt as well, and a cover, which mostly works. Um, in moving down the center console, excuse the cup, you also get your drive mode selector, so you can switch between the various drive modes, uh, conserve, excite, etc. You also have slippery, deep conditions, and that's about it. So you can set it up to drive in whatever it is that you happen to be, uh, whatever conditions you find yourself. So um, what they feel like, we'll talk about when uh, when we get on the road, you get your e-brake, you get a little storage compartment and a couple of uh, standard cup holders. You also get a center console, which is where the wireless charging port is. I have my phone in there backwards at the moment, but uh, yeah, it's right there. It's like a, <laughs> excuse me, a little storage pocket or something. It's very strange. I don't like these these ones. It's they do it I so that you basically excuse me. You can't look at your phone while it's charging. Fair enough. I understand the theory and the rationale. Uh, this is just cumbersome and awkward to open and slide that in there. And you got to make sure you slide it in the right way because I kept putting it in backwards, including today. Put that back in the cup holder. Um, we also get. Uh, the leather. The leather in this car is really quite nice. It's of a high quality. It's very supple and soft. Um, you get a strange seat arrangement with Lincoln's. You get kind of the plastic backing and then like a whole separate pad and you have power adjustment, etc. It's nice. It's a comfortable seat um, without, you know, without being too sporty or any of that nonsense. Um, very different though. Kind of a, a, an unusual arrangement for this part of the bucket, but yeah, it's nice. I like it. Uh, you also get sunroof up here. Uh, this is the opening part of the sunroof. And then you get the entire panoramic glass, uh, which extends all the way to the back. Okay, let's have a look at the back seat of the Lincoln Corsair. I'm going to keep saying that so I don't forget. Uh, so sliding in the back, I'm sliding behind my own driving position. And shutting the door. There we go. Quite comfortable, actually. You can see lots of leg room, um, which isn't too bad. Uh, you can get full-size adults back here, two of them. And uh, yeah, it's not a bad place to sit, actually. It's quite a comfortable seat. The leather is, is of a high quality and feels good under your butt. Uh, we get a full panoramic, well, I guess a dual pane maybe. No, it's all glass up top. Um, we get a, but a, a panoramic sunroof in this vehicle, which is really nice to see. What it gives you is light back here. It doesn't feel so gloomy. Combine that with the, uh, what is the color of this? Cocoa? Cocoa? I'll have to look at the sheet, but um, this light brown leather uh, really brightens up this space. It's nice. It can be really gloomy in the back seats of a lot of cars because it's all black. And if the day is overcast, it's just kind of ugly. But back here is it's quite pleasant today. The sun has come out. It has stopped raining for 10 seconds. So, yeah, it's actually quite an enjoyable place to be. You get the requisite cup holder <clears throat> in the uh, center armrest here. You also get heated seats in the back, the controls for which are on the center console, of course, you get vents and you get power. So you get, what do you get back here? You get USBs, old and new. Come on. And more USBs, both old. 
so you will not lack power back here and that's a nice touch i like that four four usb ports um, are more than enough for back here and should keep your kids entertained so that you don't have to talk to them um, and that's that's kind of it oh oh sorry i almost forgot uh, you do get i don't know how i'll do this in a pov video but you get tilting seats back here it's nice i know you can get those in hyundai's these days but it's a it's a nice feature that they've added to this vehicle so i wanted to point that out it's nice to have that little bit of adjustment especially um you know if you have adults back here it makes it much more comfortable so this trim level uh, of the, th this is the reserve trim level. Uh, this and the standard, which is the base trim, come with a two liter turbo engine. You get 254 horsepower and about 275 pound feet of torque. Uh, it all goes through an eight speed transmission. You get all wheel drive as standard across the range, no matter which vehicle you get. Um, it, it's a perfectly acceptable amount of power. Um, the, the problem, I think it, it's not the, the engine that's the issue. The transmission is a little, it holds it's not very smooth you know you'll be you'll routinely like this engine likes to shift a little at lower rpms unless you're really romping on it and then the turbo kicks in etc but the it holds gears it's a little uh, 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 you get that kind of sorry for that but that's what you get um it's not it's not the smoothest i guess transmission is the problem um and i i wanted to make a note of it it was kind of a little disappointing and when you kick it into sport mode you know that gets it, it gets a little more sort of, I don't know. Uh, it just, yeah, it just does that. I'm not gonna make the sound again, <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, it, it does more of that. I don't, I didn't find the sport mode to be any kind of an improvement over the, the standard driving mode. Um, it makes a little more exhaust noise and they tinker, but that's it. I mean, it doesn't really, yeah, I don't know. It tightens up the suspension a bit, but I don't know. I didn't, and I don't go into a car like this for sporty driving, but the transmission is not as smooth as I would like is what I am trying to say. So, you know, a little bit of reprogramming perhaps, and it would smooth out, um, you know, shifting from one gear to another. So despite um, my issues with the transmission, just want to make sure I don't crash into anybody here. Um, I do, I do like the way other than that, I like the way the car drives. It's very smooth. Um, even on a windy day like today, when the wind is pushing me around on the road, I feel very stable. Uh, I feel sort of locked into the, my lane, etc. All of that's quite nice. Um, it's a relatively quiet cabin. I can hear the wind noise because the wind is actively blowing right now and we're on snow tires. So the road noise is a little bit amplified, but for the most part, it's, it's quiet in here. It's quite nice. You turn on that comm screen and I tell ya, you, you're just in bliss. So one thing that I've noticed about the Corsair is how small it is. Um, it, it doesn't look that small on the outside. It doesn't look huge, of course, but it, it is a it is a, a small car. I was I was struck by that, and it drives like a small car, which is nice. It's very nimble. It has an excellent turning radius. It fits in the tightest of parking spots. You know, I had I I went to <laughs> I always mention it, but I did the Costco run in this thing a couple of days ago. I had miles of room in that parking spot. It was incredible. So that's uh, that's nice. It's very it, you could almost almost park it in a like a standard parking spot and feel confident that uh that the idiot next door isn't going to dent your car because you're you're not like that close to them um almost i would still park in the back of the parking lot but that's a me thing so typically when i get um, a vehicle to test i don't get the amount of time with it i would normally like it's usually anywhere between a couple of hours to perhaps a day uh this is actually my first proper press loaner i've had this for well i've had it for six days now and uh and i have it for actually a total of 10 but typically you get them for a week and I'm very excited about that. I think that's that's pretty amazing. Um, and one of the things that I'm able to test with that is actual real world fuel economy. So the two liter in this thing is rated at 11.2 in the city and I think 8.1 on the highway with a combined of 9.8. Um, we I have driven this thing now a grand total of just over 350 kilometers. It is a healthy mix of highway, urban driving, a little bit of idling, um, very standard driving, right? The stuff that you and I do all day long. So it gives you a hint of what this vehicle actually produces. And I'm gonna pull over here so I don't crash while we discuss what the dash here has to tell us because I reset the the uh, the, t the counters when put it in park um, when I picked up the car right from uh, where I picked it up so after 354.9 kilometers we and 12 hours of, of drive time we are averaging 11.3 kilometers 11.3 uh, liters pardon me per 100 kilometers and that is how much in miles per gallon I have no idea but um, 
that is that is considerably higher than the combined number that comes from um, from the manufacturer. It doesn't surprise me. Those numbers are always wrong. I don't know how they test it. It must be some kind of super linear thing, very predictable, etc. Life isn't like that. Real roads aren't like that, and real drivers aren't like that. I'm not a lead foot. It's none of that stuff. I'm just a normal everyday driver. Um, so that's kind of where we are. It is way higher than I expected it to be. Um, well, no, it's not higher. Than, it's high, much higher than they indicated it would be. It doesn't actually surprise me. So that's a bit disappointing. But it does give you an idea of where of what sort of fuel economy you can actually expect from this vehicle should you choose to buy one. So the Lincoln Corsair uh, starts right around forty nine thousand dollars Canadian. Uh, this, as tested, this reserve tops out at sixty seven thousand dollars Canadian. Um, yeah, so that is a boatload of money. It's a lot of money. This is a small car, and that if you if you choose to spend that much money on your small luxury SUV, you have a lot of choice, my friends. There are, I mean, you can go to the Germans, you can go to other Japanese, or uh, sorry, the Japanese, other American manufacturers is what I was aiming at. The Koreans are producing, Genesis has some uh, really nice cars in that. There are so many options, so many, I couldn't even research them all before I, re I recorded the video. But I did look up a couple that kind of interested me. And you can get, if you choose to do $70,000, you can get an AMG GLC, is that the right one? Mercedes and their alphanumeric names, but GLC SUV, uh, 40, 43. So that's kind of the AMG breathed over version of that. And that comes with 400 horsepower and almost the same amount of torque. Like that is a, that is a fun to drive car, you know, and it, it's right around $70,000. And you'll get most of the same equipment you get on this, on this vehicle. It is, yeah, you have, listen, if you choose to spend that kind of money, lots of options. There's the BMW X3. The, um, another one to actually consider if you prefer American luxury over say German uh, is the the Cadillac XT4 or five, because if you're gonna spend 60 to 70 grand, you can get, I mean that, you can get top shell, top row models of both of those cars and you'll get more horsepower. You get a bigger vehicle if you go for the XT5. Um, and you can, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, the, you know, the world is your oyster if you're willing to spend that kind of money. Um, and the, the Cadillac is quite nice. I think this interior might be a touch nicer, slightly nicer leather, et cetera, but um, that is a better infotainment system. You get way more power and it's a bigger car. Um, and I think it's actually almost as good looking. So yeah, I mean, you know, consider your options carefully is what I'm trying to say. Um, now, with regards to this vehicle specifically, you can you can knock that back. You get a decent car at forty nine thousand um, dollars. Yeah, this this has I mean, just tons and tons of little packages added to it and eighteen thousand dollars worth of options, <laughs> which is I mean, just lunacy, right? You know, so yeah, do uh, do your homework, test drive lots of stuff. So car makers these days seem to think that we want all their cars, all their cars have to basically look the same. It's not enough that they share, you know, a few design elements and all that other kind of stuff. They all have to look the same. Mazda's guilty of this. I love Mazda's cars. You guys know that. Um, but they, like you go through their SUV range in particular, and whether it be the, it used to be the CX-3, the CX-5 and the CX-9, from a distance or like on an, unless they're stacked up next to each other, sometimes it's hard to tell what you're looking at. You know, because they all they all have the same face, they all have effectively the same shape, they're just different sizes. So if you're further enough away, it's hard to tell. You know, the differences between the CX-5 and the CX-9, and then the, et cetera, et cetera, I'm babbling, but you get my point. Lincoln is guilty of the same thing. They, they only make four cars. They make this, they make the Nautilus, the the Aviator, and the Navigator. The This, the Corsair, and the, the Nautilus, and the Aviator, I mean, they look similar. You know, size differences, of course, right? But you know, I mean, especially you compare this to the Nautilus. I mean, they're hard to tell tell apart. You know, because Nautilus isn't that much bigger, and more interior space, etc. Slightly different design, but they all like, especially the the face of them. I mean, they look bloody identical. It's incredible. You know, so I don't know why you have to do that. You know, you can share elements of a design to make sure that when people see the car, they know, you know, they know what it, 
what, what manufacturer it is, but why do they all have to look the same? Then what's the point? You know, it has no character. I don't, I don't get it. That, that's always been a, a disappointment. And you see it more and more, you know, across the line with a lot of manufacturers. They're really harmonizing their designs that way and it drives me absolutely bonkers. Well, I guess that brings us to the question I ask at the end of every video. Would I buy one of these things? And the answer is no. I just, I couldn't do it. Given what they want for this thing, there are so many options. So many options that you just couldn't justify buying one. You know, I'm sorry to say it. I, I like Lincoln. I'm a Ford fan, etc. They just, especially when you start adding on bits and pieces. Yeah, you can... You know, I mean, the base model of this vehicle is perfectly acceptable, uh, but even that, I mean, you know, approaches $50,000 and there are just so many choices, you know, and I would probably go, yeah, I would go Japanese or German um, as opposed to, or even consider that Cadillac, truly. Uh, Cadillac's doing good things. Um, I hope Lincoln continues to do what they're doing with their models, continue to improve and refine and really earn uh, the position, you know, that they want to be in, in the luxury segment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just too much money. <laughs> it's the long and the short of it. Uh, so I guess that's going to bring us to the end of the video. I thank you all very, very much for watching. Um, we just ticked over. I was looking at it this morning. I just ticked over 200 subscribers. That's amazing. I didn't think 200 people would be interested enough in my videos. So thank you to everyone who has, uh, subscribed. If you haven't go ahead and do it. You know, you want to please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all in the next one. Have a good one, my friends. Thank you so much.